All right, so we're going to carry on. Uh, still, I think it is important. I know we haven't got to the assessment piece yet, but it's really important to understand what it is that we're trying to assess and capture. We've been talking about this idea of pain, and what I want to start to introduce now are, are a couple of, of models of pain that we can use. And in particular, this neural matrix model is one that's going to frame our discussion going forward today. Uh, so this was initially um, put forth by a fellow by the name of Ron Melzack. Um, and some of you will be familiar with that name. Melzack and Wall also gave us the gate control theory of pain back in 65. Um, the neural matrix model was sort of a bit of an update to that. Um, I think the first publication was in 98, and it's been a bit refined since that time. But there's a couple things that I like about this model, and I think it's worth our while to look at it. First of all, the idea here that pain is but one possible output. If you look over here on the right, these are the outputs. Okay? So pain perception is one. It's got sensory, affective, and cognitive dimensions. But then there's also this idea of action programs, as I mentioned, the motor system. We've got uh, stress regulation programs. And then we've listed a couple of specific ones here. Cortisol, noradrenaline, endorphin, immune system. So we'll talk about the autonomic system, all these sorts of things. That The outputs are quite varied here. It doesn't always have to be pain. Or it's more often it's pain and something else. Okay? But what's more interesting and more useful to us uh, for today's talk is what's happening on the left-hand side. And these are sort of like the inputs into the pain system. And traditionally, um, these inputs are, you'll see there's a SCA sort of within that, um, that little circle there. S was uh, stood for the sensory discriminative aspect, sensory discriminative, which would be things like location, intensity, quality, okay, those sorts of things, frequency. The C represents the cognitive and evaluative components of your pain. And this is a really important piece. This really has to do with assigning meaning to this experience. All right, what does this mean? A really simple example, if I can give you this, as far as sort of how, you know, how meaning affects our experience. As I say, I just bought a new house. I've been doing lots of work out in the garage. Let's say I was out there and I was hanging some shelves, and I whacked my hammer, or whacked my thumb with a hammer. And the next morning I'm going to wake up, and chances are my thumb's going to be kind of black. And I go, oh, man, so I'm going to lose this nail. Not overly concerned about it, just a bit bothered that I, that I did that. Let's say I had the exact same experience where I woke up one morning and my thumbnail was black. It looked like it was about to fall off, but I'd never hit it with a hammer. So exactly the same experience, same stimulus, but a very different meaning. Right? Because now I'm going, geez, what's wrong with my thumb? I better go and see my doctor and all that sort of thing. So this cognitive value of component really influences our pain perceptions. And then finally, the A usually is, uh, has traditionally stood for the motivational affect. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we heard earlier that um, our, our emotions certainly influence our pain experience. There's some rather interesting discussion around, say, the relationship between depression and pain. And which, dire which direction is that relationship moving? I think most of us can appreciate that pain probably, especially chronic pain, eventually may cause depression. But is it also possible that depression may in fact cause pain? And any of you uh, who are watching commercials, at least here in Ontario these days, may see the Depression Hurts set of commercials, which are trying to explain this idea that yeah, depression can actually lead to physical pain. And this is also one of the reasons why antidepressants are becoming uh, more common therapies for chronic pain problems. So the neural matrix model basically says we have this sensory discriminative domain of pain, which is where is it, how intense is it, what's it feel like, the real sort of basic factual information. We've got this cognitive evaluative experience, uh, or domain, sorry, which is, what's it mean? What happened the last time I experienced this? What, if anything, um, or what, maybe what worked in the past, that kind of thing. And then there's this motivational affective piece, which is, how does this make me feel? Uh, how am I feeling right now? Is there anything I need to do about this? Okay. And it's only when all these three domains kind of come together that somewhere in the middle there, might we experience pain? And this helps us maybe understand a little bit around how we can perhaps have an intense, unpleasant sensory experience, which would satisfy the sensory discriminative domain. But if it's not assigned meaning of potential damage, then my experience may not be pain. Okay? I can think of many intense, unpleasant experiences, terrible smells, you know, uh, terrible sounds, all these sorts of things, which maybe are not necessarily painful. Okay. 
Okay. Um, so it's only when these three domains all sort of come together and all of them say, A, this is an intense, unpleasant experience. B, this means that I may be um, uh, damaging myself or there may be some tissue damage occurring. And C, that this is making me feel really, uh, really unhappy. I don't like this feeling. When only when all three of those things are satisfied is one of the potential outputs pain. What this also means is that when we're trying to comprehensively assess somebody in pain, it's worth our while to get to do some kind of assessment that taps into all three of these different domains. And that's what we're going to do today. <coughs> so, I think I hit this. Uh, pain is an output, not an input. I will say this, I hope that after today I never hear anybody say something like pain receptors or the pain signal travels to the brain. Okay. No. Nociception may be what's traveling to the brain. Pain is the output. Okay. Let's make sure we're very clear on that. Um, as I mentioned, the sensory discriminative aspect is only one of three domains, all of which are necessary. We mentioned the perception must be assigned meaning, it must be associated with emotion or motivation. Only when all three of those uh, indicate threat or harm, pain is one possible experience. But again, it's going to be worth our while to evaluate all three of those domains. A couple of things, I guess, to keep in mind that by the time a patient uh, has chosen to seek out care, has come to you in the clinic, they've probably already gone through this. They've already excluded this experience. They're, they're, again, the supercomputer up here has said this is potentially harmful. This is potentially a threat not only to my current self, but you know, thing, if I don't get this remediated, it may influence who I can become in the future. So this is important to me. I'm coming to you because I have an assumption that you can reduce my unpleasant experience, remediate any damage so I can get back to my normal life, and reduce any likelihood of future damage. So that's why I'm there. Okay. I think what's important here then is that uh, a pain narrative is a behavior, a pain behavior. Uh, that a rating on a scale is a pain behavior just the same as wincing, grimacing, or bracing is a pain behavior. I'm giving you a number, I'm saying I have pain because I want you to help. So as I've said earlier, and I think we need to keep this in mind, that you know that 0 to 10 scale, or whatever pain rating scale we use, is not necessarily an accurate indicator of exactly what's happening in someone's nervous system. Okay. This is an interaction, this is a transaction between you and I, where I'm saying I need some help. If I tell you the right story, you'll give me the right treatment. That's the kind of transactions you're involved in. So what are we measuring? The nature of the unpleasant experience um, from the patient's perspective, influenced necessarily by how they understand the scale you've given them. We'll talk about different scales we can use. And then, of course, filtered by your own experience. Okay? So really, it's gone through a couple of different filters by the time you're trying to under make sense and understand what the patient is saying. Really, that's what we're measuring. It's a social transaction. It's between the patient and you. The patient hopes they're offering enough that you're going to give back help. It is a proxy of the true experience. What I mean by that is it's sort of an approximation. We can't actually see how much pain somebody's experiencing. As I mentioned earlier, there's no gold standard. Really what we're asking to do is take all of this sensory discriminative aspect, this cognitive evaluative aspect, this motivational affective aspect, boil all of these things down to a number between 0 and 10 sometimes can be very difficult. And as I say again, it's a pain behavior. 